Hope is a gift you don't have to surrender, a power you don't have to throw away. Inside the word emergency is emerge. From an emergency, new things come forth. The old certainties are crumbling fast, but danger and possibility are sisters. The future is dark with darkness as much of the womb as of the grave. Says author of Hope in the Dark, Untold Histories, Wild Possibilities, Rebecca Solnit. The future is a funny thing. Sometimes it feels like we have no control. Sometimes we feel like we can't influence it. Often we are witnesses to things we never thought or imagined could be. Today's sermon title, for those of you who didn't see it, The Future Called and It Wants Its Hope Back, is simply stating that instead of being the darkness of the tomb, what if we thought of it as the darkness of the womb? A place where new life begins, a place where possibilities are created. Unitarian Universalists don't all agree on a definition of the soul. I know, shocking. One definition I really like is that it is the spiritual essence of a person. I know we also don't agree on what spiritual means as well. But just go with me on this. Rebecca Solnit also says, either we have hope within us or we don't. It is a dimension of the soul. It is not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of a situation. Hope is not prognostication. It is an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond the horizon. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early successes, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. It's an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and anchored somewhere beyond the horizon, she says. So one of the questions that this poses is how do we transcend the immediacy of everything that we hear in the news or see on social media to turn our orientation towards a spiritual experiencing of hope. How do we, in all the challenges that come to us in the world today, find meaning and work to achieve something because it's good, because it's good, not just because it has a chance to succeed? We Unitarian Universalists are people of outcomes. We like to know what the target goals are. We speak in our governance of ends statements. I saw a smile out there. We also live in the DMV with its culture of metrics and statistics and factoids and rules and guidelines and regulations. And I know some of us are secret, secretly and actually sometimes not so secretly perfectionists. That always gets a little chuckle from the perfectionists. Yet all, with all this data, with all this data, with all these predictions, with all the surveys and polls and pundits, we are still only minimally good at predicting what the future holds. This could actually be a sermon about what it means to let go to not be so attached to the outcomes, but it's actually more than that. David Eaton, the former senior minister, the first African-American minister, senior minister of All Souls in D.C., once wrote, the church is that institution whose primary purpose is to help people maintain hope in their lives. When people have no hope, they, 
discover hope together. When they can't discover hope, they create hope together. This sermon is not supposed to be a commercial about attending UUCF. I am not trying to convert visitors to every week churchgoers. Although if you'd like to be an every week churchgoer, that would be fine. I'm not even trying to tell you that this is a perfect place to find hope. What I do know is here we try to find that place in the soul, that place of spiritual existence, the holy, the divine, the sacred, or just the space in our existence that is within us, between us, or beyond us. Where we connect with the things that are good, that are life-affirming, that are astounding, that bring us joy and beauty, that tenderly holds our grief, that finds comfort in our connection and helps bring forth that most mysterious of human striving, the soul-filling allotment of hope. Our futures are still being written, but we all have to have a part in that script. How we think about it and how we approach it will have plenty, a, a pretty substantial impact on the direction of the story. Now, I've been asked, what does wholeness mean? If we're saying that we're trying to live our lives in our wholeness, does that mean I'm only part something or that I need to be more? I've been asked this question more than once. Well, I believe that wholeness is the ability to experience all that we are to acknowledge the things that we carry with us and may wish to carry with us and may not want to carry with us, but we do. And how we center ourselves with that knowledge in ways that allows all of those things to live in harmony. That's what I believe wholeness is. If we don't carry our hope with us, or we suppress it, or we disregard it, the picture of the future may be painted with the colors of distress and worry. I'm not suggesting that we don't acknowledge the many and obvious challenges we face. I am suggesting that if we want hope to survive in the world today, then every day, well, that's how the song goes, but then every day we have to be intentional about allowing hope to live in us. My colleague, UU Minister of Victoria Safford, and someone who I believe is a beautiful and thoughtful writer, she wrote this. She said, our mission is to plant ourselves at the gates of hope, not the prudent gates of optimism, which is somewhat narrower, nor the stalwart, boring gates of common sense, nor the strident gates of self-righteousness, which creak on shrill and angry hinges nor the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything's going to be all right. Which again brings us to this together part. I was young when I first belonged to a religious community. It was the community of my heritage and of my ancestors. I still, so, I still, so love, I still love so many things about the Jewish culture and aspects of the practice of the faith. And one of the things I love most is so many of the messages of the high holidays, messages of renewal, of forgiveness, of the ability to find a new path as we begin a new year. This happens on this weekend of Rosh Hashanah. Literally, the head, Rosh is head, head of the new year. The prayers on Rosh Hashanah are about, hopefully, the sweet year to come. That's why we eat apples with honey on it, which I would do every day anyway. For me, this is never about doing it alone. I don't think it's possible to do this alone. We do this in relationship to what is in us, what is between us, and what is beyond us. We do this holding hope as part of our wholeness. We do this by keeping our souls, however soul is defined, with the light of hope that can spark a hope for the future, even through times of enormous challenge. 
I don't know, maybe it's time to stop being so damn realistic and spend a little more time dreaming about what is possible. The life of Czech Unitarian and creator of the Flower Communion that we do on Easter, Norbert Chopik, was ended in 1942 at the hands of the Nazis. Before he died in the Dresden prison camp, he penned these words. I invite you to close your eyes, if you will, if you wish, and listen. In the depths of my soul, there where lies the source of my strength, where the divine and the human meet, there, quiet your mind, quiet, quiet. Outside, let lightning rain. Horrible darkness frighten the world. But from the depths of your own soul, from that silence will rise again. God's flower. Return to yourself. Rest in yourself. Live in the depths of your soul, where the divine and the human meet. Tune your heart to the eternal and in the depths of your own soul, your panting quiets down. Where the divine and the human meet, that is our refuge. Amen. And let that be so.